I'm ready. Okay. okay. Welcome to Rock Stop. Hi, pleasure. What kind of memories do you have from your gig in Finland about three years ago? This time we are in Stockholm. Right, the Finland gig. Um, I remember most people being drunk. That was my main memory, was because uh, we came there the third day of the festival. I mean, the festival had been going on from what I could see. So everybody was um, already pretty out of it. It was kind of fun. I had a good time. I remember staying up all night in the bar of the hotel we were in, having a good party. I remember that much. I don't really remember playing very the actual performance. I don't remember at all. This time you don't come to Finland with Aerosmith. You mm -hmm. cancelled the gig. You were supposed to come. What was the reason for that? Oh, we were. I don't know. They never, t never <laughs> oh, told me. they never tell you. On a, well, on a tour like this, that uh. things of that nature are more Aerosmith's responsibility. I mean, we merely just go where they go and play. It's not a concern of us, so that's why I don't know. Nobody told me. I heard that you are going now on your own on tour after this. Is it true? You're on yeah, your own yeah. Sonic Temple yeah, tour? We're gonna do, yeah, we, we've decided to uh, go headlining. So next week we'll be in uh, in England. We start in Birmingham, um, and we do a British tour, then uh, I think Can uh, Canadian tour, and then into America about Christmas time, and then two or three months in the United States. What's your attitude towards touring? What is the most difficult part of it? Is it the travelling or? Uh... Um, I don't rightly know. Uh, I, I can't think. Yeah, traveling's tough, you know, um, tiring. Um, but it, it's fun overall. I think for for a band like the Cult, I think it's almost essential to tour. You know, we like it. Rock bands tend to be touring bands, so it's not something that you can kind of go. Well, I don't want to. You just kind of have to get to grips with it, you know, and accept it for what it is. This comes out in the beginning of January, so we already have the new, brand new decade then, right. 1990s. Many bands say that they have the 60s feeling with the 90s sounds. Do you, do you feel that your band is one of these groups, or how would you describe your own sound? Um, I probably like the sound of like AD 90, you know, We're kind of like the Stone Age. We bring back, no, I don't know what it is. I guess the cult's kind of like we bring back the Bronze Age, if anything else. You know, it's probably about the closest I can get. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I'm hardly really aware of the 80s. I, I, the, the 80s, personally, to me, that didn't represent a lot. I mean, it's unfortunate. I mean, other than the fact that I've made my musical career in the 80s, it's not a great time, I don't think. There wasn't any kind of revolution in rock music? I'm not one to look for a revolution. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people who really feel and believe that rock music should be about that kind of thing. Personally, I just buy records to listen to. You know, they make me happy. They're part of my life that it's not... You know, I just buy an album if, if I like the sound of it for different reasons. I, I don't really care whether there's musical revolutions or... But, you know, the less... You know, the early 80s, I found, was a fairly terrible time musically. Very little going on of any great substance. And it's nice to be in the second half of the 80s, I guess, at least where rock's back, music with a bit of an attitude. Um, you know, the early 80s, I find, a very kind of like a vacuum period musical, like post-punk nothingness. Someone said in this show, I think it was Chris from Pet Shop Boys, that in America everything is like rock. If you order a beer, it's a big rock and roll event. Hey man, beer. And in Britain it's not an issue. Rock is sort of in the background. What do you think? You have been touring in both both places. I guess he's right. Um, I guess that, that in England rock and roll, uh, heavy rock music is treated as something a little bit aside um, from the norms of music. I mean, if the Pet Shop Boys are considered normal, you know, I personally find them fairly abnormal. You know, from their name to everything they're about, I find fairly scary. And I'm sure they find, like, music that, like the Colt and people like me pretty scary. 
Um, there's room for everything in music, and I think it's a kind of narrow-minded, smug British attitude that a lot of musicians like those guys have, that everything's wonderful in Britain and, and that, that everything in America is kind of vulgar and stupid. You know, it's very much a very shallow mm. analysis, I think. Um, that's just a personal opinion. That, that, you know, lots of things in America are oh, hate, rock and roll. The Pet Shop Boys have incredibly good success there. You know, they have hit singles in America. But the, the key to it is that so do Motley Crue. In the same chart, you'll find Motley Crue and the Pet Shop Boys. In Britain, you'll only find the Pet Shop Boys, unless the cult have a hit that's once in a while. You know what I mean? But that's basically the difference, I guess. How much do, does your music change from the first demo to the final mix? Sometimes is, is it surprising to oh. hear the result? Some people say that they know immediately the song that they, mm. they know how it's going to sound. How yeah, a lot, a lot of the songs do. I would say probably about 60% of the songs I know we can kind of guess what they're going to sound like. There are a few that surprise us, but for the most part, you know what's what. I mean, we don't you know, I mean, a lot of the stuff we've written lately has been written on acoustic guitars with, you know, it tends to turn out to fairly heavy rock songs, but... No, I, I pretty much know what's gonna, gonna happen with them. There's no major surprises. Actually, quite a lot of the time, it's a, a selection of, like, disappointments with songs. Sometimes songs just don't turn out quite like you had in your mind's eye. And we find that sometimes it's just like, you know, there's nothing you can do to make it sound like you imagined it. And you, you're probably just harboring like an illusion that, of a sound that, that's, you know, not tangible anyway, you know. Do you have a lot of material when you go to the studio, a lot of songs to choose from then in um, the end? Or do you choose them before you go there? We, we, we normally write them before. Um, in, we, like with Sonic Temple, we spent a long time writing and rewriting and, and pre-producing the album. Um, there have been other albums that we've done where we've gone in a little less prepared or a little more confused. Um, Sonic Temple was pretty together. Uh, the songs, we had all the lyrics and we pretty much knew what we were going to do with that one. Uh, kind of like the Love album, that, that was pretty to a together recording. Um, we kind of just went in and did the job that we had to do. It wasn't like a miraculous thing while we knew in this instance, Bob Rock was going to get great sounds. We felt that we'd already done a few weeks' rehearsals with him and that he'd got a lot of the problems with the songs sorted out, helped me and Ian to write them. So it really was just kind of executing all those ideas. What is the atmosphere like in the studio? Is it like perfect harmony or do you question <coughs> a lot each other's views? Or Mostly with us, we don't, we don't have a lot of um, cause to uh, argue because the cult really came about because myself, Jamie and Ian had a certain desire to do a type of music back in 1983. We didn't really have the ability at that point or really the knowledge, but all we knew was we didn't want to make the kind of music that we had been making in our previous groups. We wanted to get together and do something different. And um, I think that's one of the main reasons why we don't really row about material. It's generally three guys heading in the same direction, you know, now we've got a drummer, hopefully it'll be four guys, you know. How about these new members of the band, have they changed your sound? No, no, so we've only, no, no, not really, I think, you know, it, it's really just been drummer changes. We've had about um, three drummers in the group um, uh, that have left or been fired for various reasons, some mental problems, some uh, te just physical, not playing well enough. Um, two of the guys were quite a long time ago, they were more than four years ago, so really, you know, it, it just gives a sense of impermanence to the cult, which I dislike, but um, we're not just going to keep some guy who can't play very well. So we've got a guy now um, who seems to fit in and can play real well, so hopefully, you know, he'll be the permanent drummer. Like Bonham. Like who? Like Bonham. Bonham. You have compared him to John Bonham. 
in an interview. Did oh, I never did. It wasn't me. <laughs> okay, so Definitely somebody not. else. What has yeah. been the most difficult thing for your band? Has it been the finding the right members, the right atmosphere, or the right following, maybe? Or has no. everything gone like uh, upwards? For the cult. Um, I'm trying to think. It's an interesting question. Nobody's really asked me before what's the most difficult thing. A hit single here and there wouldn't go amiss, you know, right now. To be totally honest, if we could get a big hit single in America, it would make our lives a lot easier. But it doesn't really mean that we're not achieving. Every album the cult makes sell, sells more than the ones before we know. Like, we sell two or three million copies of our albums, um, which I think probably is, is very good, you know, but I'm always, we always want to do better. And I think the difference between where we're at right now and real international, total international success is basically like one hit single. Because I think the music we make, when people actually open their minds to it and their ears to it, we do great. We've got a very strong following, you know, people who've liked us over a period of years. So I think that um, exposure to people who don't really care is what the cult needs. It's not a question of we need to write better songs, we need to change our image, we need to do this, that and the other. We really just, sometimes people just don't care enough. And if, in a, particularly in the United States with a name like the, the cult, which a lot of, um, of those kind of beer swilling Americans we talked about before associate with like devil worship or some mm. kind of satanic that's their only reference. Every time they open a newspaper, there's some, you know, devil worshipping cult around. Once you get overcome that and just explain it's a name like any other, like The Who or The Clash or what did the Beatles mean and who cares anyway. Once you get over that, you, you, you know, we do, we do very well. But um, that's basically all I'd hope for is a lucky break, you know. We're going to show Fire Woman. Could you tell us about that song? We're going to show the video. A fire woman. Um, there's not. There's not really a lot to tell. It's. It. It was one of about 20 songs we had. It seemed even from the outset to be rather kind of. Um, how do we put it? Catchy, if you know what I mean. It was like. It always sounded like it could potentially be a single. Uh, when Ian came up with the singing, that was kind of when he came up with the hook to it, that was pretty cool. It sounded like a, a single. And we just, you know, that was it. We didn't really go out of our way to make it too commercial. I mean, you know, it's over five minutes long, which is not really that wonderful, you know. A lot of the songs that we were writing at that time are over five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes long on Sonic Temple. But um, the song... Um, you know, the, the song could be about any, I mean, it's about a girl with a fiery temperament, lyrically, that's what it's about. Um, fairly self-explanatory lyrics, I mean, it's a single, you know, you're not gonna, you know, write a small history of, you know, China in a pop single, but on the other hand, um, making a video was a lot of fun, we did that in Hollywood, California, and had a good time, a lot, uh, lot of work, making those videos are, you know, it's a lot of money, a lot of work. Um, and it's nice, I think, that we can make a video that's five minutes long that hasn't got, you know, just like loads of stupid women in miniskirts running around in them for no good reason. It's all it is is a performance by the band, and it still looks interesting, I think, because of the colours that we used and the way it was shot was a little different to everybody else's, so... It's just one of our things. We try not to use boilers in the video, people, you know, some rock bands, most rock bands do. You know, I find that a little bit kind of crass. Uh, we tend to feel that as a band, um, you know, it's just one of the things that, that we don't really want to kind of have to lower ourselves to get video play, you know, by having girls in schoolgirl uniforms and stuff running around. Um, even though the songs are about women and, you know, that I mean, Sonic Temple's fairly, basically the 90% of the, the album is written about sex some description or other, it's, it's a fairly sexual album. Um, that, that just that, that kind of gross usage of it, I find fairly vulgar, you know, women. You know, you can't wait for a rock video to start before you... Someone walks what, in. The woman in the walks in in the high heels. It's kind of, like, boring, and it works for bands like, you know, Rat Marillion. and stuff. 
It well, makes it's perfect sense. Yeah, they're stupid because they're a band that really shouldn't do stuff like that. They don't really need to resort to it, but they, you know, I guess it depends. I don't know why people do it. You know, we just won't. We're also working on a guitar player documentary, and we're asking everybody's opinions on guitars and right. what does what do guitars mean to you? <coughs> Um, Many people, for example, collect guitars. Rick Nielsen has thousands. Right, I met, yeah, I met Rick Nielsen um, a few months ago, funnily enough, and uh, Robin Zander, who's uh, one of the nicer guys in the music business, actually. I've been going through and meet a lot of rock stars who are really nice guys. All of Aerosmith are very charming. It's a delight touring with them. Um, it's nice to meet these people and find that they're not like, you know, the gentlemen, mm. you know, and, and uh, it's, it's real nice. Um, I used to collect them a little bit, no particular, to me they're kind of a tool, really. I like the kind of guitars I like, I'm not a big fan of modern heavy metal guitar playing, you know, in the kind of sub Eddie, Eddie Van Halen kind of style, Yngwie, very classical, very G.I.T. Um, I don't really find that very appealing, um, but you know, I'm a more of a 70s guy. You know, more of a Mick Ronson, Jimmy Page, Mick Ralphs, Paul Kossoff kind of... Uh, that's my trip, and, and, and the, to me the most... The common denominator of all those guys is mostly the Gibson Les Paul, which is the guitar that's on the front cover of Sonic Temple. It's the first guitar I ever had bought when I was a, a boy of 14 or whatever. Um, it was a copy of it. So they, they, they mean a lot to me. They're like the blues guitar. It's one of the two original electric guitars ever made. Mm. Um, and that's basically it. I've used Gretsch's. A lot of kids probably have seen in a lot of videos me using a big white guitar, which is a Gretsch White Falcon. Um, I like Gretsch's. I still think some Gretsch guitars are good, not all of them. But they're certainly good for certain sounds, but a very problematic live. And not very good for rock, you know, you can't really... I tried very hard, but they're just not made for rock guitar soloing, you know. And uh, So I, I only use them now, like, for fun. Do you rehearse a lot? For example, Vinnie Moore told that he can rehearse for hours every day. He's, mm. like, very technical. Oh, some guys do. I mean, it's obvious you do not get to the level of, of technical expertise of, say, Yngwie, or an Yngwie, or, um, you know whoever, Joe Unpronounceable, or yeah, whatever, whoever, one of these guys. You don't get to that level without hours of studious practicing, but it's a newer thing. I mean, for me, guitar was a way out of doing things like that. It was a reason not to have piano lessons and having to the disciplines of learning a classical instrument was I didn't want to practice five hours a day. I wanted to go out and get drunk, and guitar was something that I kind of enjoyed, but it wasn't becoming like a religion. And a lot of these guys now, these young kids growing up, seem to think that if you if you spend four, eight hours a day practicing guitar, it's going to make you a good guitarist. It's not. It's going to make you a technician. You know, like if you spend eight hours practicing to be a violinist, you would eventually become a violinist of sorts. But the talent, emotion, and I guess experience goes into making great guitar players, I think. Not, not just the technique. You've got to live life and do things and be a personality and be... So when you play a guitar note, it means something. Not that you got it out of a book. You know, you got it off the street, you learn it. You, I don't know, it's just my opinion on it. It's, that's why I look at guitar playing. It's, it's um, part of you. It's not something you can get out of a book and spend... You can try, you try to put your feelings into it and... Yeah, yeah, right, from the fact that I actually bothered to ever learn a little bit anyway was enough to get me out of working in an office or whatever, you know. What do you think of Keith Richards, his solo project? Um, I thought that... I enjoyed it a lot. I liked the whole thing. I didn't go and see him. Ian went to see him in Los Angeles. I didn't go to the show. I don't, I, I don't even think I was there. I, was out, I wasn't even in America at the time. Um, I kind of dig it. I mean, I dig Keith Richards. You know, I think that he is... Um, how would you put it? Well, it's just like he is kind of like the, the most pivotal figure. I mean, he's never, you know... Actually, arguably, he is a brilliant guitar player. You know what I mean? He, he's a brilliant... He understands 
I think, is the best thing about Keith Richards. If, if there's something to grasp in rock and roll, he grasped it quite a long time ago. Um, but as I say, I bought the record, um, all the artwork and the presentation and the promo and everything was like really cool. Tour shirts were good. And some of the songs on the album were good, you know? He said that living for him is the most important thing. How about you? What is the most important thing for you? Um, He's lucky that he wakes up every morning. Pro probably, yeah. Um, you've got to be health, hasn't it? I mean, any anybody you ask, you know, anybody on the street, what the most important things are, and I think the most important thing is be happy and healthy. Forget rock and roll or forget anything. You know, if you're not healthy or happy, then you that to me is more important than anything. Um, other than that, you know, I personally try not. To, Try not to get too wound up in like worrying about making money and stuff like that. You know, I've got like a bit of a side of me that's a bit business orientated, which is kind of boring. You know, I don't want to be like some kind of bread breadhead man. You know, no breadheads. So. Mm. Into what direction do you think you will go in the future? Probably or down do there and out that door, <laughs> in the over to the coffee pot, um, right. down onto the street. Uh, um, no plans after that. Do you just let your music develop? Uh, well, yeah, there's You don't no, have to do a record every now and then? There's no master plan. I think just common sense dictates that, you know, we're now approaching... The next thing I know, it, it's going to be Christmas time, you know? Does Christmas mean something, especially for you? Uh, or has, have people forgotten all about it? I like it. it. Christmas means, you know, I, Christmas to me means things like the Rupert Annual, which probably nobody ever got in <laughs> Finland, so it's a bit irrelevant. No. <laughs> but, Little drawings of little furry animals, old carol singing with... It never snows in England at Christmas. It always snows in January. So Christmas, the weather's likely to be like it is today, grey and wet, which is a bit of a disappointment when you've grown up to think of Christmas as holly. And I like all that. I spent last Christmas in Los Angeles, and I don't know whether I like that. It was all, you know, palm trees and sunny weather, and I don't know whether that, that's the way to go, but... I d it doesn't really. It's a fam family kind of time, I guess. But, you know, I never really had a big family kind of Christmas upbringing, to be honest, because I'm an only kind of child. Which explains a lot, probably. All the Freudian young students of Freud By out the way, there. Are so going, am I. That explains <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so, um, you know, so that does, it doesn't mean that too much of a thing to me. Um, you know, I guess, you know, as a Christian, um, you know, I'm a kind of, you know, Christian with pagan leanings, you know what I mean? I tend to lean to what I start looking at trees and the woods and, you know, things like that quite a lot lately. The last few years, it's an alarming tendency of mine, you know, sort of like, you know, like pagan kind of stuff, Celtic stuff, I suppose. Mm. I'm beginning to sniff around that, you know, it's finding it a little more interesting than, uh, you know, the regular church, yes, but... If you could change one thing in rock and roll business, what would it be? Bad contracts to musicians would probably change. You know, I so have an alarm. So we need a musician's lib <laughs> or um, something like that. We need, we need a musician's union in England that is actually relevant to what's going on, um, not some kind of farcical, outdated thing that, you know, was probably relevant in about 1935. Um, I think that, that the amount of people I know of... Okay? Yeah, okay, throw okay. <laughs> um, Bad contracts, that's why I change. Did you have a bad contract in the beginning, or...? I, I had a little bit... I had a bit of a problem with some managers in England that, that looked like it was going to get nasty, and then it looks like finally being settled, settled amicably, which is great. But that incident a couple of years ago highlighted to me some of the things where, as a musician, you really can't win in England um, if you sign certain contracts. So that's a personal thing. I wouldn't sign another management-style contract in England and knowing now what I've learned in the last seven, eight years. It's like, you know, not what I do, but, you know, there's a few bad contracts, you know, 
nowhere near as bad as it was, like in you know the 60s um, and the early 70s when it was all like all the rock bands were like so out of it. It's like Aerosmith, for example. I mean, they didn't know half the things they were signing because they were so out of it. So if somebody lobbed them loads of drugs and bottles of Jack Daniels, they would have signed anything. It's changed a lot since punk that people probably like me are more aware of what's going on, but it still has a ways to go before a fair situation arises, I think. I, th I don't think it's fair right now. It's fair for people like George Michael, maybe, and Michael Jackson. When you get big, and we've, we've gotten to a stage where we've renegotiated and got a fair deal. If we'd have had this deal four or five years ago, it would have been a lot better, and that's why, you know, kind of gets me down, but, you know. On the other hand, it, you know, there's a lot of good things about being in a band. That's just the one bummer I don't. Could you still say something about Paul McCartney? We have him in our show next week. He was here in Stockholm about right. a month ago. Right. He's uh, playing 15 Beatles songs on this tour, even songs which he never played together with John Lennon. Really? Like Sgt. Pepper and Hey Jude. Oh, he's doing so all that stuff. Is it a bit risky or...? Uh, not really. I, I don't... I, I file the Beatles under... Um, to me, what they meant to me, not a great deal. In, I was too young in the 60s. I mean, they, they'd stopped playing, you know, they'd broken up by the time I was even really... 69, I think. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't even out of short pants then, you know, I was only like seven years old or something. It was like, no. Um, they, I look back on them like I look back on mini skirts and the Mini Cooper and Carnaby Street and a whole time that London seemed to be really vibrant. Um, a really great period for, for, for the, you know, England and particularly London and, you know, England won the World Cup and things like that. That's why I look back. It's a feeling of nostalgia. I mean, um, you know, and it's, it's great that he goes out there and he plays to people because there's a lot of people out there who are uh, from the generation who grew up with Paul McCartney who still want to hear what he's doing. I haven't got a problem with older musicians continuing to play as long as they're you know, good performers. Nobody expects him to write Hey Dude again. You know, he did it once and it's probably one of the best songs ever written. So I think he's got a, more of a right <laughs> to, to perform than in a lot of other people. So I haven't got a criticism. I mean, I'm not the world's biggest, you know, Macca fan. But um, plus the Beatles are very funny and they come from Liverpool, which is near where I come from. So I've got to stick together with all the northerners in England and... Uh, you know, good for him. And I mean, you know, it's good to see the wife still there playing tambourine, you know. And the keyboards. I'm not sure she's if probably he's... Late. What, she's he probably wasn't plugged into the amplifier. They, gonna, they, <laughs> they have gonna, a keyboard player also. They're probably going to upset Linda and tell her she hasn't been plugged in. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for all of these. Sooner or later, they're going to... Maybe when she gets to be about 50, they're going to turn the amp on. Do you think that you will be playing after 20 years from now on? Who knows? I... I um, let me think. Yeah, yeah, probably. I, I, I would imagine I'll play, and I'm getting right into the blues now, so, you know, that could be it, really. I'll be off just being like some, you know, hocus kind of blues hack, you know, learning all that kind of old dreadful. I'll listen, find me listening to dreadfully bad Johnny Winter albums from 1968 and 69. Um, what would that make me? Yeah, I'll probably still be playing. I think it'll be scaled down, I'll be down to a little, you know, little amplifier and a nice one old guitar and a plane, go and do clubs and stuff. Ian says he'll be singing in the clubs that I own when we're that age. So, uh, I don't know, maybe he's, he's got more than a lot of people. And one more thing, something to everybody in Finland, if you are still watching. Yeah, if, if all you Finns are still there and you haven't opened your borders up to Russia or... Uh, had 10 million Russians coming in your living rooms. Um, what do you say to some Phil? Hi, how's it going? Um, come visit us in England sometime and uh, go and see the Queen. And you, you know. see the address, it's written down there. It's down there in a little box. It says, come and visit Great Britain. This is a broadcast from the British Tourist Board. Yeah, we have subtitles all the time. So. Oh, yeah, I can hold things. Yeah, right, somewhere there. And then groovy the graphics can come up here. Oh, well, the traffic. Oh, yeah. Your name will be here and right. the subtitles will be. Right, so you can do things like that. Come and visit me in England. And um, go down to your local supermarket and buy a box full of cult CDs. Make me a happy man. Okay, can I still introduce you in Finnish? Yeah. Cool. And you'll never know what I say. 
Okay, this then. This is the fun part. Okay, then. This is the bit what most people like, then. Right. Ja ensi kerralla on Rockstopissa sitten uuden vuoden katsaus. Ja paikalla on muun muassa The Cult. Näin muuten on. Hi. Believe me. That's easy for her to say. Believe me. Right. It's our yearbook, which can...